Um, but I want to remind people, I've said this from day one on this, what you see today, you might not see tomorrow. So today at 11 o'clock, we're going to reactivate um, the flood control spillway. We're going to open the gates and progress over a number of hours up to 50,000 CFS. Um, so over the past couple of weeks, we've been evaluating what, what that level of release should be, whether that's 40,000 CFS or 50. So we're going to start at 50,000 CFS. And towards the end of this run, which will be five to six days, depending on the influence of the reservoir, we'll ramp down to 40, continuously evaluate the condition of the, um, the flood control spillway to see how it's performing. And then we'll make decisions here during the week on how we will step down out of 50,000 to 40,000 and ultimately back down to zero. We do need to spill the reservoir, get down to an elevation that we're targeting 835, 838 feet. That will be right kind of where we're going to need to stop unless our spillway acts um, the way we hope it does with all the mitigation measures that we put in place. That, again, that decision on where we do and how we step it will be made later in the week as we assess the, the function of the spillway. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, good morning. Again, Bill Croyle, Acting Director with the California Department of Water Resources. So we have uh, another watershed moment in our effort here in addressing our concern with our flood control spillway. So what I'm going to do is start off with some of the, the standard numbers that we all like to hear about. Um, so right now, the currently, there is no release of water over the flood control spillway. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. The lake elevation is 864 feet. So it's risen about a foot in the last 24 hours. Fortunately, we've had some amazing weather here in Butte County and up Canyon here in the last week or so, which has allowed us to continue a really a high uh, level of activity with regard to work on the emergency spillway, uh, removal of debris material in the, at the um, diversion pool. So the high power plant is running right now at 12,900. So as we step up our flows on the spillway today, we'll start backing off on the Hyatt powerhouse. Ultimately, today that will be zero coming out of Hyatt. The reason for that is we want to make sure we understand the backwater effect on the powerhouse. Ulti you know, we want to protect that powerhouse. So if we start moving that water and we have a backwater effect, again, raising that elevation on the Hyatt powerhouse, then we want to understand what, how high it might get, again, as we reach full capacity on the spillway. Our desire, of course, is to reoperate that Hyatt powerhouse as soon as we can. Uh, we might wait for the duration of this event and restart that plant later in the week. And, but if we feel like it's safe to run both the spillway and the powerhouse at the same time, we're obviously going to do that, so that helps us move water out of the reservoir. With the incoming weather, it does, it does look like it's this morning is forecasted to be a little cooler than it was forecast a couple days ago, which is in some ways good. Um, I would like to see some additional snow melt and the rain come so that we can move some water during this spill event out of the reservoir. So again, that would be one of the factors that might extend the duration of this spill. So again, we'll go over these pictures in just a moment, but this includes uh, grouting the face uh, underneath the spillway where we have the, uh, the damage occur. We have a few pictures there, some rock bolting. So we've gone into the spillway and rock bolted or basically reconnected, reinforced the concrete spillway back to the what I call Mother Earth. The idea is to make sure nothing moves around while we go through the spill event. Um, we've also gone to extreme efforts to basically clean out and caulk every crack that we can find on the deck. Um, the idea there is to ensure that we don't have any additional water moving down through that deck that might further comp uh, compromise the system. I want to set that expectation is because this is an impaired system, what we're doing in mitigation this measures, continuous monitoring throughout not just the spill event, but every day uh, we're continuing to assess the condition and what things are moving around. Um, and that's why it's so important to better understand the mitigation measures that we are fortunately be able to put in. So again, uh, we'll look 
and when we come back af off of uh, this spill event, we'll go back in, reassess, see what's moved around or not moved around, and if there's additional measures that we can take, we will take them. So with that, I'll move on to any, any questions. I think we're about two weeks from actually seeing uh, what some of those graphics look like. Uh, I was briefed yesterday on, as they narrow down some of the options. Um, again, they're looking at both what permanent or temporary options might be. So what they're looking at is, and we're running this again together, not only with the various design teams, but with the regulatory agencies and the independent board that's overlooking everyone's shoulder. So as they're vetting those alternatives, we expect to have our kind of top two within the next two weeks, and then they'll go through an assessment of constructability, schedule, and resources. We need to make sure the resources are available to do one or more option. We're doing two because if there's a critical flaw in any of that schedule, resource needs, or just the design, then we can off that and choose the other option. Is it going to look, is this, whatever these two options are, is it going to look similar in design to what we have now? There's a whole bunch of different options. Some are pretty interesting. Some are exactly what you see there. Um, then it's a matter: is it you know what what floor rates are you designing to? So you, you might see something that looks similar to what was there, but designed for a lower flow rate, which means we have to operate the reservoir differently. And that's part of the going back and forth with not only our designers, but with the regulatory agencies and then ultimately the independent board. Okay, that, that'll be and. Hopefully less than two weeks, but in the next two weeks we'll, I think, we'll be excited to see what the, those options kind of look like. Question? Are you any closer to figuring out exactly what caused the damage to the, the flood control still and which you need to know that before uh, constructing the gate? That team's come together now, and so they'll come along and look at all the information that we, we see on the site now, the geotechnical information that will be Produced through the okay, this okay, as long as it all works. <laughs> okay, obviously, I'm fighting with the microphone up here. Hopefully, it's everyone can hear. So, as, as those um, the forensics teams come together and put that together, you know, a lot of what we would want to know is actually washed down into the river. So, I think the geotechnical information, the condition of the deck. Um, is all going to be part of that forensic analysis. So absolutely, any information that's coming to bear while we're doing all this is going to be very important to the design team and the independent board and our regulatory partners. Okay, in the red. Um, actually, we have our, our industrial hygienists here, um, but as they, why don't you come on up, and Dave, and so, but, so we've done our due diligence. We're working very closely with the Air Quality Management District, testing, verification testing. Um, so there's the amphibolites being, has been identified, come on over. Um, but I think those detection limits are very low. And so there hasn't been any employees or, um, but we're also doing aggressively um, as you would in any construction project, the dust mitigation, uh, you know, all the typical um, dust concerns are being addressed by some of our uh, best management practices. Let me just speak to it. Where are you founded? Is it limited to a small section of the hill? Yeah, the, uh, the geology of this area has uh, naturally occurring asbestos in it throughout this region and a lot of places in California. Uh, when we got on site we, and we got access to the spillway after it was stabilized, we did some surveys from an industrial hygiene standpoint. We're not geologists. So we're looking at it from a community exposure assessment and also our worker exposures. So we looked for anything that we thought was suspect, sampled it, 
And in conjunction with the AQMD, we've developed a plan to protect the community and our workers, too. Uh, and we've got a robust 24-hour-a-day air sampling uh, campaign going on right now. They're rushed out to laboratories. We're getting very encouraging uh, results coming back right now, but it's in final QC before it's released. But right now, we're very optimistic about the outcomes. Uh, my name's David Beadle, B-E-A-D-L-E. -E. I'm a certified industrial hygienist and also a certified asbestos consultant in California. How, how wide are the, the range are you monitoring? Uh, we monitor uh, the perimeter of our work zones, and that uh, is being still established. Uh, we're uh, bringing in more equipment every day as we see the need and see uh, uh, potential areas that we'd like to study. And then within the work zones, it, we have a very dynamic system. As the work changes and the objectives change, we change our air sampling techniques to match that. Just grab the whole thing. The uh, the areas of concern that have been identified, and again, it's a very large place. Uh, the thing for us that made it um, a little bit easier to look at was it was scoured clean. From a geological standpoint, it's a great opportunity to look at the rocks. Once it's under the dirt, we can't really tell unless it's on the surface. Uh, there's been you know hundreds of people traversing this area, and a lot of our geology team. So if they see anything that's suspect, they bring it to our attention. We would flag it and pinpoint it. But right now, small vein in here, and it kind of traverses the hill. But historically, there's uh, notes of asbestos in the area all the way back to 1868. So it, it's geologically just part of what we live with is in this region of California and others, too. So uh, even though we've got a massive or, or very large work site, the places that it's been identified are minimal. However, because we, you know, we're still in that sampling phase and we're waiting for some analytical, until all the analyticals in, we're erring on the side of caution and protecting the community. So again, 24 hour a day uh, microscopy techniques are being employed and uh, uh, we're using the best labs that uh, we have access to and they're all on very rapid turnarounds. And again, the outcomes right now are very optimistic. Um, no, not really. It, it looks like a rock. It, it would be, I mean, it's, uh, we're so used to in, uh, you know, um, our society right now of asbestos and building products. So you think about floor tiles and drywalls and shingles and things like that. And that's what we're used to in the K through 12 asbestos rules that we use to protect our children at schools. Uh, this is really kind of different because it's the raw material that was provided to us in the geology that we're, we're on top of. So it, it's basically a rock. Yeah, okay. Other important questions, please? I think the record speaks for itself with regard to the level of effort that's gone into monitoring, assessing, investigating the site in general. Um, the records speak for themselves. When we look at our records, which have been made available to the public, um, we've actually, we being the department, our regulatory agencies, and independent third parties have been all over the site for a number of years. I think one of the more recent reports Instead of just five independent consultants, we had 20 involved. And so with regard to the emergency spillway and the spillway itself, nobody identified any kind of potential risks that we have here. When we have challenges with regard to maintenance, the records speak for themselves on what, what work was done, when it was completed, etc. But that will also be all part of, I think, all of us, the industry, whether it's dams, spillways, flood control systems, water supply, wastewater plants, 
everybody is relooking at what we do to monitor, assess, inspect. Um, whether you're an owner, an operator, or a regulator, looking at critical infrastructure. So is it not done? Is it not inspect the property? In other words, is there, is there any person on site or anywhere else who is responsible for this having happened by not doing due diligence to make sure this didn't happen? We believe that. Well, as a dam owner, the facility owner, ultimately the department's responsible. We believe we've done everything that we are required to do and more with regard to any actions that led up to this. So if you're looking for who's, re if you're looking for who's responsible... Because this didn't happen. So there's many citizens out there who I see that were upset. They say, well, somebody has to be accountable because this should have happened. That's why we're paying to make sure this doesn't happen. So there's nobody, one person or a group of people that are responsible for this. Again, I would say as a dam owner and operator, we, we're required by the regulatory agencies to perform our due diligence and correct any deficiencies that are identified. We believe we've done that. The regulatory agencies, I think, have a robust record of doing their job, as well as the independent third parties. And so. This happens. Stuff happens. And so um, you get a flat tire on your car. Uh, you're running your car out of oil. I mean, these things are these things happen. And so you know, we're going to get into how this happened, why it happened. You know, again, that'll be done by this um, this independent body of experts. Um, and so we'll and we'll learn a lot from this. And not just here at Orville. We're going to learn a lot across the world. The world is looking at what happened here, how we all interact. Um, that's an important process as we kind of look at some of our technology and our infrastructure that we have in place. Next reporter, please. What's the cost to date and what's the estimated cost total? Um, like, there's some numbers that are uh, been used early in this process to replace the spillway between 100 and 200 million dollars is likely to be much higher as we get into this and see the cost of removing the debris and coming back to whether it's a temporary or permanent fix, not just with the spillway, with the emergency spillway, um, you know, how we manage the sediment in the river, you know, the necessary resources, you know, like haul roads to get in and, and fix this facility. So we're going to know a lot more about some of the costs to uh, repair this site here in the next couple weeks, but then also we have some more longer range um, efforts that we have to do recover from this incident that may actually take us a couple years. So those activities are being vetted out now, and that will be part of our recovery team's effort to better define those costs. Um, so far? Well, the numbers that, I've, that I'm aware of through the end of February is, is like, um, what was it? I don't, Mark, do you remember, I'd, as I sit here, all of a sudden, it's a hundred million dollars. So I think it was, you know, it, it, every day it kind of changed a little bit, depending on, like, as an example, the day you're using six helicopters can get pretty expensive. Uh, right now, those costs are far lower. We don't have as many um, excavators and trucks running around because there's not enough room and we're about ready to spill. But during February, I think the average was about $4.7 million a day. Thanks, Mark. Another question? If the fixes for the spillway not hold up, for example, let's say tomorrow, would you stop water coming out of the spillway to reassess on off that kind of So we, it's a good question because we're getting, we, uh, we have a very active and uh, we have a team of, again, a wide variety of um, professionals, safety people included that are very important to keep everybody safe. Everybody wants to get close to the, to the end of this to watch all this happen. And so we got to keep people safe. And so we're going to watch to see what happens. Again, we believe that measures we have taken are really proactive at trying to uh, mitigate the concern with losing additional concrete off the spillway. So again, trying to set expectations, we may see some of that move. And so at the moment, I need to get some water out of this reservoir. So as long as we don't see, you know, catastrophic loss of a lot of concrete, then we're going to need to roll through this. We need to use this spillway at least one more time and maybe two more times. And so, again, when we see what happens, if it all stays there and say, great, we'll look to see if we can do more measures so we can, again, use that spillway again. You know, if we see a lot of trouble, 
That's why we have our monitoring teams and we can adjust on the fly. And that's why I so appreciate the various agencies in you know, the technical side as well as the regulatory agencies here in this unified command so we can have these conversations on the fly reach agreement and if we need to deploy another corrective measure we can do it. I mean I appreciate the, the, the grout and the rock bolting, a lot of this comes from the Army Corps of Engineers. That's why they're part of our command structure is so we can kind of quickly assess and make those decisions and assess the safety aspects of this, the constructability, the expected results of that ever. But we're also dealing with as we learned through all this, Mother Nature's <laughs> right behind you. Uh, we've been lucky with the amazing weather we've had over the last couple of weeks, but as this project has told us, you've got to be ready for everything. Yeah? Do you know when reconstruction could begin in earnest? That's a good question. So when you, that's, when you ask that question, it's already started. The drill rig's on site. I mean, you might not see the concrete and the form boards going up, as an example, but the the building the hull roads, the rock crushing plant on site, the concrete batch plant, you know, all the cultural assessments, um, all the stormwater management, all that's important to start the construction. So that is starting now. Um, again, once you get the physical design done, approved, vetted through all the, the regulatory agencies and the independent board, then you'll start seeing more material, but there are some things that we need to start on. Part of the reconstruction will be um, prioritizing what concrete needs to come off that mountain. So you might see the concrete at the lower part of the spillway be removed before any work is done on the top. But work is planned on the top. So the spillway that you see up here, again, you may not see later in the summer, so they might want to replace that. I expect that they would. Now, you might not see that until late in the summer, but that is, I think, a pertinent part of how we move forward. Do you, do you anticipate the spillway gates staying basically the same? Yeah, the spillway gates, obviously, they're an important part of assessing the condition of the spillway itself, but um, any, like, complete redo of the spillway is a completely different activity, and that's factored into if there's changes that need to be, it'll come into what the permanent fix look like. Yeah, I think we're up for questions. Yep. All right, everyone, thank you for uh, joining us.